Welcome to Friday. I'm Thomas Frank Carr. This is the BWI Live Show. I'm here to tell you about five things I'm looking for tomorrow during the Penn State Whiteout. It's going to be a great game. Penn State, Iowa, coming in with some really interesting uh, season themes, some interesting data we're going to look at today. All of that coming up on the BWI Live Show. And as always on Friday, you are my co-host, just like Penn State Post Game Shows. I'm talking to you in the live chat. This is a great opportunity if you want to ask me questions like, let's start out with this one. Frack the Hunter says, T. Frank, why is nobody talking about the weather? I don't really know. Uh, this is one of the weather is one of those things that's like the last thing on the checklist for people when they're previewing a game. Like, we want to talk about guards and defensive ends and linebackers and Running the football in fullbacks. Weather, it, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a factor. Um, so I'll give it to you right now. Uh, this is according to the National Weather Service, by the way, because everyone, here's another thing, Frack the Hunter. Everyone's so touchy about, like, my weather service is better than yours, and I have the most accurate one. I don't know. I'm going to the National Weather Service, so just leave me alone. Rain likely, cloudy around 50, uh, low around 53. Winds. 11 to 13 miles an hour, gusts as high as 21. Chance of uh, precipitation during the day, 100%. New, preci new precipitation, it's not that hard of a word. New precipitation amounts between a tenth and a quarter of an inch possible. Is that a lot? I don't know. Is that a lot of rain? Is that not a lot of rain? Um, I am not a meteorologist, but rain and weather are in the forecast. Um, that's not one of the five things we're watching for tomorrow. Just, just to give you a heads up. But um, we'll talk about stuff that you want to talk about on the show today. So join me in the chat, be my co-host, and we'll uh, get to what's on your mind. We're getting through the five things, but before we do that, I want to let you know today's sponsor of the show is Caldera Labs. Guys, uh, we need to take better care of ourselves, both internally and externally. So go get your checkups, go get your yearly physicals and all of those things. But if you don't want to age like your dad, and, and my, my whole life, has been like, hey, I'm not going to do the things that I noticed that don't make any sense. So, you know, you want to you wanna be healthy, you want to live a long and healthy life, and you want to look as young as possible for as long as possible, Caldera Labs, they have a great how to use and how to stay young. I love these products. Uh, I've been using them now for a couple of weeks. They are super swanky feeling. They feel, I, I think I called it executive level the other day. And here's the other thing that I really like. Uh, so, you know, I have pretty sensitive skin, and these have not made me break out in any way, shape, or form just yet. So I use mostly this base layer for just general moisturizing, and then I use this for your eyes. Uh, specifically, it's a serum just to put around your eyes so that you moisturize your face. Like, that's not a crazy thing to do. People have been doing that for thousands of years. So 94% of men showed younger, healthier-looking skin when using Caldera Labs. So check it out and use the promo code BWI. For 20% off your first purchase when you go to calderalabs.com. Okay, all that out of the way, let's get to number five. Number five. The run game. Here we go again. Penn State, the offensive line. Is this the week that they're not going to be soft? Sorry, I, I've... It's been a long season already, <laughs> so like the internet has gotten to a part of my brain, and like there is a there's an extreme misconception of what Penn State is and what you think they are in terms of their ability to run block. They are much better than they have shown, but yes, the production needs to be better. There there is a middle ground that we need to find. J B Nelson is destroying people. Uh, he is a big-time mauling offensive lineman. Hunter Norzad, quick, explosive, strong, good football player. But they just need to they need to be cohesive and block together. And the tight ends are a part of this. But let's talk about this particular situation of Penn State's run personality. That's what I'm super interested in this week. This is the first time that they're going to see a four-down front. Now they play against a four-down front every single day in practice. They, they go up against the Penn State defense. Now, while that is an entirely different animal from the, from the Iowa defensive front, it's the first time this year they haven't seen nose tackles and guys lined up directly head over the tackle. So there's going to be different running situations this week. Does that cause a change? Does that fit better or worse into the Penn State rushing attack? That's just the first thing from a curiosity standpoint that I'm interested to find out. Because, you know, they're going to see 
I think, more four-down fronts for the rest of the year against their primary opponents than they are going to be against uh, teams that run an odd front. So, the problem is still the same. Defensive tackles in the middle for Iowa are, are talented football players, and I want to get their names correct because they're, they are good football players and they deserve that. Um, number 85 in the middle, Logan Lee, good football player. Number 94, maybe not on the same level as him, but also another good football player. Um, their two starting defensive tackles, uh, Yah, uh, Yahya Black. So you've got what you expect from Iowa. Big, strong defensive tackles in the middle. And it's interesting watching them play football. They don't, they don't stunt and slant and move like Penn State, but they do subtle things, subtle adjustments pre and post snap that have a similar effect of they are much more static of, hey, I'm in the B gap, come at me, bro. But, you know, if they, if they get a beat on what you're going to do, whether it's inside zone, outside zone, counter, man, power, whatever it is, if they have a tell on what you're about to do, they will take one player and move him laterally from, you know, one technique to another and try to ruin your run game with positioning and, uh, and cutting off the, the, the primary point of access for your run game. So they do a lot of good things on the interior. Um, uh, Joe Evans... Really physical defensive end. Penn State played a couple of those last week. Uh, Joe Evans probably a little bit more active in terms of, I don't know, it's overall speed, but ferocity to get to the football. Um, the man is a human missile, so he's going to be interesting to to watch Penn State block. Um, but that those are the guys up front that are control this game. And so for Penn State fans asking, uh, you know, are they going to... Are there... Uh, this is from Larry. He says they're not Illinois level on the D line. I, I think that's a fair point to make. Obviously, Jazan Newton is in a different category. There's no guy like that in this game. But across the board, they've got four physical, disciplined defensive linemen that are going to try and control the game. Uh, Illinois stacked the box. They put eight, seven, consistently putting guys in the box. Illinois is not, uh, or Iowa is not going to do that. So the 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 um, challenge is going to be different this week from a from a schematic perspective, and that's where I'm can I'm wondering out loud, wondering is this the week we see a pivot in the run game, or is Mike Yersich finally getting to where he wants to be with his rushing attack? And let me explain with the power of graphics. Okay, so the run balance. The last two years, man versus zone. Pretty basic, high-level stuff. Is it inside or outside zone, or is it all of the other types of running schemes? In 2022, Penn State did not run as much zone as they had in the past. In fact, the first two years under Yersich, they did not run as much zone. This year, they're hitting a clip of 55% between inside and outside zone, making them a zone rushing team, which is, as you can see, different than last year. But... New system up front that they're attacking. They have had a lot of success with their counter. Uh, pulling two linemen or two players from the back to the front side. Do we see that this week? Do we see them try to attack those defensive tackles by alignment and try to get players um, up the field with a different style than the zone running where you're looking for your hole, you're picking it and hitting up field? Is this the week we see Nick Singleton break one because he's more comfortable just in his career of football, playing behind pulling offensive linemen than he is reading those zone rushes. We've talked a lot this week about him reading, maybe some hesitation, doesn't want to hit the hole because he's trying to make the right decision. What if the decision is, hey, we're pulling two guards, you go there. <laughs> that he has had success, you think back to the Auburn game, um, games uh, last season where he had a lot of his big runs come from that particular style of rushing. And if you don't have a three-down lineman, you don't have a nose tackle and then a defensive tackle, head up on where you would normally pull, making that hard, if that guy is inside and then outside and there's more of a natural bubble there, is Penn State going to attack with a counter game? It's something that I'm looking for from, is this a pivot week for Penn State on the rushing, in the rushing attack? Last week, they didn't have a good matchup and they didn't pivot. They just ran what they ran. We'll see if it happens this week. And let's get into number four. Number four. 
the way, if you're enjoying the show today and you're, you you want to get more analysis and breakdown of the game and see, you know, if any of these things came to fruition, uh, I do my full-on T. Frank's film room where I don't just talk about it like I do here. I show you examples. I give you clips. I have, do it as best I can with the stuff that I have, give you little pointers and coaches, like markers. I, it, it, it is what it is. But if you want to check it out, sign up right now. During our big game special this week, Blue White Illustrated new subscribers can get 50% off the full year price. That is an awesome deal for the whiteout. So if you want to get a breakdown of this game on Sunday and then Monday, BlueWhiteIllustrated.com is your place to get that. That's what I do, what I can offer you from a premium perspective. I had an article yesterday about James Franklin talking about how the pass coverage works for Penn State. How you get guys to, to throw into the coverage you want. How do you get quarterbacks? to make a mistake, to hesitate, to clutch. Well, he and I, he answered that question when I asked him, and then I went deep into the data to see exactly how Penn State has uh, succeeded or failed when taking away the first read. If you want to know more about that, bluewhiteillustrated.com, sign up right now, 50% off for a full year. Um, I know a bunch of ways that you can waste $50 Spend fifty dollars on your on your hobby, Penn State football, and get three hundred and sixty five days of access. That is, uh, you know, my hobbies are like woodworking and photography, and I spend way too much money on those things. If my if my if that were my hobby, if, if the football wasn't my job but my hobby, that's an awesome investment. You cannot get a better deal. So bluewhiteillustrated.com, sign up right now for fifty percent off. You can always check out in uh, in the description of the video a link to where you can subscribe. Okay. Is this the same old Iowa rushing attack? Yes. You know, from a big picture perspective, from a scheme perspective, absolutely. This is the same old Iowa rushing attack. Everything we just talked about of inside zone, outside zone, uh, what Penn State wants to do, that's a lot of similar. There's some similarities between Mike Yersich and what Iowa does. The difference can be formation and personnel where Iowa runs 13 personnel, which means three tight ends and one running back, and one wide receiver. The, you know, the extremes, running with a, a traditional fullback in the I formation, all of the classic Iowa stuff. But what is their actual success this year? That's where it's not the same old Iowa team. If we just look in the first three games, and remember, this is not against, uh, you know, it's this is against Utah State, Iowa State, and Western Michigan. So the, not a, not a, not a, excellent first three games that are going to test you they've allowed and this is where it's interesting two point yards per carry between the a gap and 2.8 in the b gap so the primary rushing attack uh for the interior moving guys off the football being physical doing a great job in their zones 21 uh carries for i'm gonna pull this up again so you can read it 21 carries 42 yards 17 carries for 48 yards this is not an explosive rushing attack the interior of this line struggles at times with physicality. Iowa State's nose tackles took it to them uh, in the center of the offensive line. So Penn State's defensive tackles, this is kind of like on the offensive line where, where we talked about this last week. Is Penn State good enough to go up against these traditional teams? I think that in this game, Penn State-Iowa is an even match on the interior if... Not a little bit of an advantage for Penn State in terms of the depth, the physicality, and the athleticism. I don't think Penn State's getting pushed off the ball by Iowa in this game. So Logan Jones is the primary left guard. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, the center, Logan Jones, is probably the weakest link on the offensive line. He struggles with power. Uh, he struggles to get to his reach blocks at times with, you know, proper positioning, and you, you can move him into the backfield. He's Struggled in both the run and pass game this year. Connor Colby, their right guard, probably the uh, the best overall player on the interior. And then they've had a left guard rotation through part of the year. So this is not a stable interior. And then when you go out to the tackles, these guys have not been tested yet specifically in, in, the, in the pass game. But the left tackle, not a dominant run blocker either. There's no Tristan Wirfs out there. They play well together, and just like every single game that we've said all year long, minus Delaware, but even Delaware proved the point. If you're not gap sound, if you're not in your gap, Iowa can absolutely rip off some big runs. If you're not playing your 
position correctly, there's always the opportunity that Iowa's run game, they're well coached, they know what to do, they play cohesively, but you can beat these guys. This is not a intimidating front uh, five like it has been in the past. I think Penn State can play up to this level. So that's going to just, hopefully, for Penn State football, for those interior guys, that's something they can uh, they, we can they can change the narrative for themselves of it's not all about the jersey that walks into the building. It's also about the player in the jersey and Penn State's defensive uh, line. I think they can play and they can they can get upfield. They can create penetration and attack this rushing attack um, and and put the ball into uh, McNamara's hands. And that's going to be a situation where Penn State is going to have an advantage. So. The rushing attack for Iowa, is it going to succeed? It has struggled so far this year on the interior. They have broken big plays, but Penn State's athleticism and their ability to chase things down in the flat, I'll be interested to see how that matchup goes. I think it's even. So going back to the conversation about whether is Iowa going to have an advantage? In, if the trenches are even, then no. Number three. So we're going to number three, and we're talking about Drew Aller. We have we've we've gone too long in the show, and I haven't said the words Drew Aller yet. So this is a really interesting matchup for me because you look at the coverage, and the coverage for Iowa is really good. You look at the pass rush. I don't know so much about that. Penn State's tackles have allowed four pressures to the outside so far this year. Now they have not faced. I would call an above average pass rusher so far. Uh, they've faced a lot of fronts that can get pressure through stunts and, and movement, but they haven't faced a guy that goes one on one and should intimidate Caden Wallace or Olufashinu. So these guys have been good so far this year, and that's the situation this uh, in this game as well. Joe Evans, their best pass rusher, he has two pressures in one sack. So that's not intimidating. Overall, the Iowa front. Uh, and the overall defense has forced 39 pressures. That is 10th uh, in the Big Ten. So bottom, near the bottom, near the absolute bottom of the Big Ten in terms of total pressure. So you've got to keep Drew Aller upright and scanning the football field because the number one weakness of zone is not other football players. It is time. Father time destroys most zones. If you, you can't cover the whole football field and you can't cover every blade of grass, especially for a super long period of time. And Drew Aller has shown in the, the first couple games, he's able to get through a progression. He's able to see his first read. If it's not there, come off of that and then know where his other receivers are on the football field so he can then target and attack. And as we said, and he's said time and time again, those uh, the defense has to give up something you just you have to find it you have to know where it is and then attack it and he's been very good at finding and attacking so if they do not get pressure on him drew aller could have a big game i've wanted all week to call this and just say it say that drew aller is going to throw for 300 yards because the pass rush can't get to him but this is a good zone coverage team and if it's raining you know every little piece of information, as we've talked about so far uh, on the show today, is important to the overall picture. So getting him in comfortable, uh, comfortable and in rhythm is a huge part of this game. And I think Penn State can do it, but if there's one area where the team has struggled, interior pressure, um, the four guys that have played the majority of the stack, snaps, Sal Wormley, J.B. Nelson, Vega Iwane, Hunter Norzat have given up a total of six quarterback hits. That is not great. In fact, that is a that could be a huge problem. Iowa doesn't blitz, but if they're going to bring pressure, uh, it is going to come from the interior. Um, you know, eighty-five the defensive tackle. He's a good. He's a decent pass rusher. They don't blitz a whole lot, but they will bring their linebackers at times. And when they do, they'll stunt and twist. And if there's one Achilles heel for Penn State and their interior players, especially over the last couple of years, it has been this pass and this pass off of of players on the interior allowing free rushers to get to the quarterback. That's going to be a part of the game. Iowa is going to try that. Literally every team does it against Penn State because it works. The difference is Drew Aller has been able to avoid it and not take big sacks. He has been able to see it coming, move in the pocket and throw, or see it 
and then run. Now, running into a zone defense that have their eyes on the quarterback, that is a that is a tougher task than it is when you're playing a, a press man, man coverage heavy team or a team that is voiding the middle of the field to cover a bunch of things. I was not going to shift their zones all that much. They are not going to spread out too wide. They're going to play even traditional zones, and they are going to make you beat them. We'll get to more on that uh, later, but that's the setup. Can Drew Aller avoid pressure up the middle, keep his eyes downfield, and attack? Obviously, the health of his receivers is Trey Wallace on the field. Is Malik McLean uh, able to bounce back from last week? And do they get the tight ends involved? So a couple of the guys that I think you can attack in this in this game, uh, the Will linebacker, Nick Jackson, I think Penn State could target him, talking about Theo Johnson getting Tyler Warren involved, attacking the flats in certain situations against um, you know the corners and the linebackers on the backside. They rotate their corners at opposite of Cooper DeGene, so Deshaun Lee and uh, Jamari Harris. Uh, both those guys have given up plays this year. They've also played well at times, but they've also given up more plays than the other parts of the defense. And then uh, Xavier Napara, if you want to shift and motion and get guys singled up against a safety, it's number one you want to target. So there are parts of the defense you can target, but can they find those targets on the football field? And then, of course, Joe Evans versus Caden Wallace. That's going to be a big matchup in this game. I would imagine that's where they're going to try and find their most pressure in this game. So that's the setup for the Penn State offense versus the defense. Take a quick break here. We've got a lot of stuff going in uh, the chat. Um... Stephen Light asks, what do you think our prospects for running are? Don't answer if you've already covered it, got here late. Yeah, we covered that early in the, that was the number one thing we started with, uh, Stephen, is we started with the run game. But I, I didn't actually answer what are the prospects. So, um, I think they're good. This is another area that I, I watching the film and watching J.B. Nelson and Hunter Norris that have success and then, Somebody come in from the backside and tackle the running back or the running back not break a tackle on a run where he's got a great running lane. I really want to say that this is the week because they've been very close a couple of times. Uh, there was one play in the West Virginia game where if Nick Singleton doesn't stumble when somebody grabs his ankle, it is a touchdown. You know, he's got, he's got one safety to beat who's on the far hash. That's a touchdown. That's what Penn State's looking for. They just need to get the right situation, and they've gotten it a bunch of times, and then the running back needs to make a guy miss, and then you've got a big play. So, you know, I'm not trying to be overly positive about the team I focus on all the time, but I see how close they are in the run game, and I see what Drew Allen can do in the, in the past game to bring it back to number three here is, like, all of these opportunities are there. What is Iowa going to do to confound those and to prevent them? I don't think Iowa's changing anything in their run in, in their run defense. They're not going to stack the box any more than they normally do. They're not going to play their coverages very different. So it's going to be about being better. And I think Penn State has the versatility. I think we haven't seen, not that they're hiding certain things in the playbook, they just haven't had to access it yet because the matchup and the players haven't dictated they go to that part of the playbook yet. So um, I think that that's going to be something that we see it, it, in the game this week. Uh, the receivers have advantage in the rain, says the real zeal. So this is interesting because, uh, you know, knowing where you're going, that is that is the number one thing, right? So you have the advantage if you can run a route. But if you don't have the pop out of your transitions, it does allow the defense to play catch up a little bit easier. So a fast track typically is an advantage for the offense and when it rains it slows things down a little bit the defense can catch up but yeah if the conditions get really bad and it's super sloppy and you need to know where you're going and you're going to slip if you don't i, I think that's I, w I never know exactly how to read the weather in that and that's why i think a lot of times just kind of ignore it of like eh, you know you look at the the game uh in the snow against west for uh, uh michigan state two years ago you would think that the offense would have the advantage Michigan State's offense had the advantage of guys slipping and Kenneth Walker running for a bunch of yards. Penn State didn't get the same advantage because they didn't force the action in space. That's that's really what it comes down to. Larry says, I was not as good at stopping the run as they've been in prior years. Uh, they're not even uh, top 50 three games in. CBS uh, covers, uh, CBS cover three covered this. Penn State may have success this style of defense 
as they did in 2021. Yeah, I agree. I, Iowa, they the problem is they have elements that are good, but the there are they're not as deep in terms of guys that can do it. So once again, defensive tackle depth this year is is not as good as it might have been in years past. Their front four, and especially their defense ends in the front four, I think they provide a physical quality test. Some of the other situations, um, uh, Utah State, late in the game, they were running uh, down, I want to say, 15 points maybe, and they were running the football. So Iowa's giving you that. Now the, the starters are in, the defensive tackle starters are not in, but the quarterback run game and some of the quarterback draws and the, the straight-up draws that they used with the running backs late in that game inflated some of those numbers. And Iowa State, they got some, some plays on them as well. So I, I think that they're... I don't want to totally dismiss them, Larry. I think you make a great point, but they do have the elements, kind of like Illinois. Last week, we went into the game against Illinois saying, we haven't seen this this defense play their best because of matchup and situation. I think that is going to be kind of the situation this week where Iowa can have a bounce-back performance, but Penn State should be able to still get yards and plays in this game. Tim C., he uh, donates to the channel here. Uh, appreciate you, Tim. Um... So uh, he says, I like the content, but I like the people on the site even more. I enjoy supporting them. Thank you very much, Tim. I apologize if, uh, you know, uh, if, if uh, I missed something here, because I feel like I'm missing something here. But thank you, Tim C., for donating to the channel. Um, appreciate you here and saying you support Blue White Illustrated. Okay, so we've got through number three, the passing attack. Let's get into number two, Cade McNamara. Who's he throwing the football to? Number two. This is the number one thing in this game that's going to dictate and determine the outcome. Uh, as much as Penn State's offense can do that by scoring points early, uh, it's because Iowa's overall threat meter is super low. It was low this year coming in. It's even lower now. Nico Regani is the team's top target as the slot receiver, number 89. He's a good football player, but... Uh, there's not a there's not a boundary receiver guys that line up on the outside that you see getting consistent separation. So what they were doing and part of Brian Ferentz's plan, James Franklin talked about that they're a multiple team, they're a pro style. They were using twelve personnel, kind of the way Penn State does, where they were using uh, tight ends in the slot, two tight end formations to make you run it, bring in heavy personnel, and then spreading you out into a three receiver set and then throwing the football. That can have effect, but it is not an explosive passing attack. And with Luke Lachey out of this game, this is a big problem for them. He's 23% of the quarterback targets so far this year from Cade McNamara. That's a huge chunk of the offense to lose. It's not even that it's 23% of the targets. It's that he's the primary target on a lot of these plays. He's also a security blanket for Cade McNamara, who you watch him and you see him stare down Lachey in a lot of these situations and a lot of these plays. They also designed a lot of the offense around the tight ends and specifically around Lachey. A couple of things I noticed. So they, they would run three-by-one formations where you've got three receivers to the field, and then you've got Lachey on the short side of the field, the boundary, essentially creating a one-on-one -on -one with him and the defensive back whether that's a uh, safety or it's a corner. Maybe it's a zone coverage and you're expecting him to beat, you know, between the two players, but it's basically one-on-one -on, -one on the backside. They were creating these situations for easy reads for Cade McNamara, and he was generating offense from that. He's also the team's deep threat. So if you look at the Iowa deep targets here, again, Regani has the most targets, five targets, he's got one catch. Lachey has four targets, Two catches for 66 yards. These are not like explosive stats, even with Lachey here. Uh, their outside receiver, Anderson, one target, uh, one catch for 36 yards, and then Luke All, one good catch on a, uh, a great read by uh, McNamara, by the way, to get back to the backside of a, of a pass play, one catch for 34 yards. But All is not their primary target. If he has to become their primary receiver, that's that same knock-on effect that you have when you're uh, losing players, and then somebody else gets bumped up into that role. They also had a lot of stuff designed around their tight ends. 13 personnel. I mentioned this earlier. 
So Penn State, when they run their large formations, they bring a, a receiver and they condense the formation to try and get green grass to the outside so the running back can break into the open. I was just bringing on more tight ends. They're not condensing receivers down. They're skipping that part. They're putting one tight end to the strength and then two tight ends to the backside and running into that with, you know, a 19-person front. So are they doing that this week? So from the passing game, huge disruption. Can they pivot in one week? And can they find a better solution to get the ball out of Cade McNamara's hands? Secondarily, uh, the run game. How much of an impact does it have where they don't have their best overall tight end? What does it do to Eric All's role? There's a lot of questions they have to ask. I'm sure they have systems in place and like they have contingencies for when players get hurt, but they've got to enact a lot of them because this was the guy in the offense that was the actual threat. He's a big threat for this team. Um, and this, is, this leads into Cade McNamara. You have taken away his security blanket. You've taken away his best receiver, the guy he looks to a lot. He's taken a lot of sacks. Um, I, I, I should have had this up here. I think his, his uh, pressure to sack ratio, which is an interesting thing you can look at, a PFF, an advanced stat of, okay, we understand you're going to get pressure as a quarterback, but what do you do with that pressure? How do you respond to it? He's been sacked almost 30% of the time, 27-ish percent. That's very high. Anything over 20, it starts to be like, okay, this is a serious problem for the offense. So this could, I, I, again, an area where I really want to call my shot. This is a week where Cade McNamara does not throw a lot of bad interceptions. He will throw the ball into single coverage. He will put the ball up there for some of his playmakers. But he's not, I would say, as reckless as Luke Altmyer was last week. So is this the week Penn State gets a bunch of inter a bunch of sacks? Yes, I could see that absolutely being the case in this game. They don't have an explosive passing attack. Their only hope to me that I think is they they go five wide. They'll spread the field out, and this is the this is the new Brian Ferentz thing of the new Brian Ferentz. I've got to score points this year. Five wide, and then dink and dunk out of the five wide. I'll give them credit. They were running a lot of vertical stuff this year. So a lot of four verticals down the field trying to stretch the defense and the zones down, uh, down the field. But they were facing a lot of four high coverages like Penn State has seen so far this year. Think back to the West Virginia game trying to attack that stuff. And if you watch T. Frank's film room, that key into what I'm talking about. This is a game where Penn State's going to play press man coverage. Once again, we talked about that yesterday. Does that change the passing attack? And which one of these dudes can get open? I think it's going to be a lot of Regani, and I think it's going to be a lot of Eric All against trying to find holes in zones and trying to run just turn around and catch the football. There's not a lot of threats here. And without um, uh, Patterson, the running back, in this game as well, the explosiveness in the run game, that's going to be... It, this is a very challenging game for the for the Iowa offense. It's not like this team comes in with a ton of offensive firepower regularly, but this is a game where Penn State, I think, has a serious advantage in the way they play, the style of defense they play, and also the personnel that they're facing. So Penn State's offense doesn't have to put up 37 points in this game. You'd still love that to happen. And we're getting into how that might happen. Number one. Larry makes a great point here. He said Cade isn't mobile, and he looks like he's hurt. PSU uh, may feast. First real shot at a non-mobile quarterback. Yes, that that's exactly. Thank you to, to nutshell what I was trying to say there. Is like he stays in the pocket. He's not mobile, so you can pin him in there, and you can attack. You, you don't need to be as concerned about rushing lanes. Uh, and he'll eat the ball. He, he won't throw the ball down the field if he's under pressure as much. So, uh, Larry, by the way, thank you for the donation to the channel. Larry's smart here as well. I'm trying to do everything by myself today, so if you donate to the channel, it shows up in these bright colors, and then I see, oh, like, oh, Larry said something. Um, that way I don't have to um and uh. <laughs> so appreciate you for, on multiple levels, Larry. Um, C. Paul King says, how many interceptions do we get in this game? Feels like there's an opportunity for multiple. Yeah, I, that's, again, it comes down to, do they get sacks or interceptions? Which way does the ball bounce in this particular situation? And Larry, I think, is on this one. I think that there will be more sacks than interceptions because if you talk about another Iowa idiom and Iowa principle is don't turn the football over, they have very conservative, careful quarterbacks over the years. 
So they're not going to throw the ball. Either. They're coached to be careful with the football. So when in doubt, take a sack and we'll punt and we'll let the defense take care of it. So this is going to be one where I think Penn State has the opportunity to get those sacks that we're talking about. You're going to see a lot of, uh, a lot of very happy defensive ends celebrating after plays. So the number one thing is not the number one thing in the game, by the way. This is just the thing that interests me the most because I like watching coverage. Probably one of my favorite things to do is watch the coverage because it dictates a lot of what the quarterback can do, what he sees, and it's one of the... It's the thing that changes the most after the snap. Unless you're playing Manny Diaz as defense, and then everything changes after the snap, especially defensive line. But most teams, what they do is they, they, they mask their coverage and they shift it. Iowa does not do that as much. They will roll between two high and one high safeties. That's the major thing they'll do is they'll show you a two high coverage shell, and then they'll rotate based on formation and, and matchups on the underneath zones where they want to provide their support and where they're predicting that your passing attack is going. So I like watching this stuff. And the interesting thing that I found is James Franklin talked about what's the new wrinkle this year in the, in, in the Iowa, we do what we do situation. And to set that up, what they do is they mostly play cover three. This is a safe uh, traditional zone coverage, and they play it in a traditional way. I'd say the major wrinkle here is that they'll play Cooper DeGene up on the line of scrimmage and then allow him to bail and play a quasi-man role in a lot of situations. So they trust their man coverage more this year, uh, even in their zone coverages. But they mainly play cover three quarters and then variants of two high looks. But the one that catches my eye is when they play two-man. And what two-man is is you're playing man coverage, but you have two deep safeties. So you get the best of both worlds in a little bit of a sense where you have um, man coverage, so you can try and take away those first read throws. You can be aggressive with receivers, but you also get the safety of playing with two deep defenders. So you get to have both ways. And the reason I'm interested in this particular coverage is because Drew Aller is not the biggest run threat. We covered that last week. He is not a guy that's traditionally going to run the football, but he will scramble. We've seen him climb the pocket. He eventually looks for a receiver, but against two man, there is no quarterback spy. The quarterback spy is playing 15 yards deep. So you can't play it against super athletic quarterbacks because the minute they see that there's no spy defender, if you don't have great rush lanes and contain in the pocket, you can sack those guys. Those guys can run and get a bunch of yards. So uh, Drew Aller, six carries, 61 yards so far this year. They play more man coverage than I was expecting this year because, again, I think they trust their man coverage skills a little more with a with a, a good top corner in Cooper DeGene. So there's going to be opportunities select throughout the game. And we're talking about they maybe run this three or four times a game but it looks like their traditional zone. So it looks like they're playing a cover two, but there's subtle differences that Aller is usually really good at identifying. And if they play this coverage, one of two things has to happen, and they have to happen. A receiver has to get open, beat that man coverage, and uh, find a hole in, you know, in the intermediate zone before you get to the deep players, so you're not running into the coverage. Or Drew Aller needs to break the pocket and scramble because there are yards to be had. You can, you can absolutely uh, make them pay, and I think Aller's a good enough athlete to make them pay to escape the pocket. He's good at getting out of bad situations and running for yards. We saw him do this against Illinois and their coverage schemes last week. If everyone's back is to the football, you might see a Drew Aller scamper of 15 yards or something like that. So that's what I'm looking for. I, I'm super interested in those decisive third down, maybe second and long, whenever they decide to run this coverage, this is where Aller has to notice the differences between the, the cover two zones and the two man zones because there are subtle differences. Um, and it's something that I'm, I'm super interested to see how he plays against that. Roy back here, he says, great work. <laughs> Thank you. That is very nice of you to say. Appreciate you donating to the channel. It, this, is, um, this is both my favorite show of the week, and this is also the one that makes me not sleep the night before because I'm up here tap dancing on my own. And last week it was rough, so this is I'm glad we're having a rebound show and everyone's appreciating uh, appreciating the show today. So Jerry says, 
Who on the Iowa defense is the biggest threat to Aller in the pocket? Um, let me pull up the names. I'm so bad at this. I apologize. I, I'm looking at the film. I'm not looking at the rosters when I'm looking at the film. So uh, uh, let's let's get the names here. Joe Evans, the defensive end, number 13. He leads the team with 12 pressures, one sack, and four quarterback hits, according to PFF. So good pass rusher, but not a ton of like sack production, not an elite pass rusher. He plays with a lot of good technique and, and effort and speed, um, but not necessarily a guy that is, he's a little stiff. So I think if, if you play, if you play sound football and you're aware that he's going to come back inside on you and he's going to try and, and, and t attack your inside shoulder, I think you can be okay here, but he is going to be a matchup night. I think he's going to be a serious problem. The best threat that Caden Wallace has seen so far this year. And then the other guy is Logan Lee. These are the guys that are the major um, threats on this defensive line. And uh, I wouldn't say it's super great. I wouldn't say like Logan Lee is an elite pass rusher. He's a good pass rusher for the interior. He can, he can make some guys miss. This is if JB Nelson is not paying attention and not playing to his uh, potential, this is an area where interior pressure from a straight four-man pass rush, these are the two guys that if you leave them alone on islands, they are going to win some of their reps. Um, but let me get put this in context. So Evans leads the team with 12 pressures. Lee has five. So we're not talking about guys that are in the double, high double digits, no, not a lot of sacks. If you play sound football and you uh, play with good, uh, you know, physicality where you're you're not allowing them the easy stuff where they're just bullying you around and Penn State's got a big strong offensive line and they move well they should be able to handle this front they should be um and, and I say this guy let, let's talk about this too this always happens to me and this this is a a typical college football analysis thing of where you have a very high threshold for certain positions and certain ability levels tackle and quarterback have a very high threshold of if you're really good you do these things and if you're not if you don't you're not um and college there's a much wider delta of guys that can be good so at tackle i you know the right tackle and i'll try and pull up his name quickly here while we're talking i i just i think that penn state should be able to get pressure on these tackles i don't think they have been tested yet either and i don't know that they're great athletes but they play well, and they do a good job of, of um, taking away the easy stuff. But I think speed and power can affect this game. Um, Mason Richmond has allowed one pressure so far this year. But again, let's talk about this. They, they were going against Iowa State. who Their pressure came from the interior. Their, their strength of their team, their defensive ends weren't good. And then you've got Iowa State. I'm sorry, uh, Utah, st too many states, Utah State and um, Western Michigan. Neither of those teams are going to have the talent that Penn State does. So the tackles here, kind of like Penn State, where they haven't, they haven't faced a speed rusher, a guy with amazing ability on the edge, and Penn State's tackles have, have looked like that so far. This Caden Wallace has looked that, that way this year. Uh, Gennings, Dunker. Jennings? Starts with a G, uh, with a G. <laughs> Jennings Dunker. Uh, he's allowed two pressures so far this year. So they, they play well, but I just think that if you're talking about who's the better athlete, Penn State has the better athlete um, in, the, in the situation of defensive end or Abdul Carter off the edge versus these guys. So that's, that's where I think you get into trouble. If you don't put those guys in those situations where it's third and long, it doesn't matter. Going back to the the Michigan game last year, I thought Penn State had a good a matchup with uh, their speed to the outside against the right tackle for Michigan. It got into maybe two third and longs the whole game, and like that's not enough opportunities for you to, to win the way that you would expect that. So I, I think um, I think in this situation, if we're talking about tackles comparatively, Penn State has the better offensive line tackles. They've got the better pass rush. They are the more talented team. They are the favorite in this game for a reason. Um, this is another question that we've had all year from C. Paul King. Is it time for the bow package? If it wasn't last week, I don't think it's coming this week. Maybe. You know, never say never. But Penn State matches up better with this defense than they do 
with a defense from a scheme perspective that puts three guys in the middle um, with the way they shade their defensive ends. This is going to be two guys in the middle, two linebackers, two defensive ends on the outside. Just like every other 4-3 defense, just like every other Iowa defense that you've seen. If Penn State runs their 12 personnel, it'll stretch that even further, and you might see them attack certain situations that way. So I don't know that they're going to use the bow package. I think Drew Aller's legs are enough to threaten in certain situations, like we talked about with two-man coverage and scrambling. And then another thing we haven't seen since week one is the quarterback run game in the short yardage situation. They showed that on film with the quarterback sweep uh, with Aller near the goal line against West Virginia. Do we see it again this week? I'm not saying that they haven't, they've been hiding anything, you know, like the, the, the whole idea of we've been holding back some of the playbook. The only way you hold back some of the playbook is if you don't think it's going to be necessarily as advantageous as just running your base offense. So we'll see. Uh, that's what I got for the show today. Appreciate everybody coming and joining us. Ah, here's one. Uh, this is M. Pillion says, T. Frank, in your eyes, what are the chances tomorrow that Brian Ferentz offense gets 25 points per game at Mark that his job is tied to? I don't think it's very good. I don't think it's very good at all. If the, So, again, the defense has scored a pick six this year in one of the games. It doesn't matter if it's 25 points per game tied to the offense. It's 25 points per game. And they've already chipped in a defensive touchdown. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to be overly negative <laughs> about a team, but just looking at the threats they have on offense, the injuries they sustained to their best player in a week where they have to adapt in seven days, an offense that they've been building around that player, I just think it's going to be tough, especially on the road in the whiteout when communication is going to be hard. So my, my uh, prediction this week was 31-17. It might be 13. You know, it's definitely not... I don't think it's 20 points. It would be a surprise, and you'd have to give them credit for... <laughs> you'd have to give them credit for for playing above what they have done so far this year and playing above expectation on the road. That would be why it would be an upset. So the, the matchups don't favor them. Penn State's strengths... And their improvement, by the way, on the defensive tackle position, they played much better in terms of hitting their gaps and being gap sound last week than the previous two weeks. So that has been improving throughout the year. Um, so thank you to everybody. Once again, I'm Thomas Frank Carr. You should sign up if you want to have more of these conversations. Get in-depth and super nerdy about football with me. I love to talk about this stuff. We've got a bunch of people. Steven is a regular both here and uh, at BlueWhiteIllustrated.com. You can join us in that conversation for 50% off. And this is the thing. The big game's coming up tomorrow. You see, it's the big game special. So this is going to end pretty soon. I don't know if it's Sunday. I don't know if it's Monday. I haven't been told those things. And I think that's part of the suspense is that you don't know when it's going to end. So do it right now. 50% off bluewhiteillustrated.com. I will put the link to subscribe in the uh, description of the video as well so that you have uh, it's super easy to sign up and go to bluewhiteillustrated.com. As always, if you're watching this show, please like and subscribe to Blue White Illustrated here on YouTube. I know I'm doing the outro where I'm saying all the things and asking you to do all the stuff. And there's a million things I'm asking you to do, whether you're listening on podcast or whatever. But this is super annoying. This is, this is super annoying to me. All week, we have been like 50 subscribers shy of 12,000. The round number game, help me out here. We need, as, a, as of right now live, uh, 31 people to subscribe to Blue White Illustrated's YouTube channel. 31. 100,000 people are coming this weekend to Happy Valley. If 31 of you subscribe, I will be very grateful. Thank you so much to everybody. Hope you have a great day. Coming up tomorrow, we'll have the post-game uh, we'll post show live after the game, breaking all this down. Was I right? Was I wrong? Uh, and, of course, pre-game, we have the tailgate show at 4.30 with Adidas Hopkins. Join us for all of that. I'm T. Frank. I'll talk to you later.